So as you know, we're reciting the Heart Sutra before every class, and the reason we're doing that is one, because we're studying philosophical tenets, and the Heart Sutra is related to the Middle Way Consequence School, the Prasangika view, which is the highest view, the most subtle view of emptiness. So we want to continually reinforce that subtlest view, even while we examine the lower views and see where they're coming from. In the Heart Sutra, there's the mantra that you're now getting familiar with, Hayata Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasangate Bodhisoha. And today I'd like to flesh out a little bit about that mantra, particularly the heart of it, Gate Gate Paragate Parasangate Bodhi. These five syllables, or these five um, sections of the mantra, for lack of a better word, these five are related to the five paths that we travel in a developmental process along the path to enlightenment. So we've discussed these five paths a few times in the past, but just to review, the path of accumulation is when we have uncontrived renunciation, the determination to be free, and then of course if you're on the Mahayana path, that's conjoined with bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment. So the first path, the path of accumulation, needs those two in an uncontrived way. In the path of preparation, you're preparing to realize emptiness directly. And in order to do that, you're working on shine, shamatha, calm abiding, serenity. Those are all synonyms. So what you're doing here at this point is you're developing your powers of concentration. You're accumulating merit as you were on the previous path, but now you're preparing to realize emptiness directly. So through the power of your strong concentration, you can't add analysis until your concentration single-pointedly is very, very stable. Until that happens, you work on analysis and single-pointedness as two separate projects. So some sessions you'll focus on one, some sessions on others. You might combine them in a session, but not at exactly the same time. A little bit like when we normally start a motivation, then shift to single-pointedness on the breath, and then shift to an analysis or a single-pointed meditation as the core of the practice. So a few things happen within a session, but once you develop concentration really stably and have actual shine, you can bring in analysis and it doesn't disturb the power of your focus. So the union of calm abiding and special insight focused on emptiness, conceptually, is the path of preparation's beginning. Calm abiding, shine, special insight, focus on emptiness. Those two combined in a conceptual way, that's the entryway to the path of preparation. So then the path of seeing is those same two unified, but they've become so habituated and so deep that it moves from conception to perception. It becomes direct. And at that point, you have the path of seeing, when that changeover occurs. So the path of seeing starts to actually create the deepest antidotes to samsara itself, helps purify negative karmic seeds at their depths, and is where incredible progress starts to happen much more quickly. The path of seeing is that meditation where it shifts from conception to perception. As soon as you arise from meditative equipoise, things still appear to be inherently existent. You just don't believe it as much. So then you go back to your meditation and you reinforce that meditation on the emptiness of inherent existence again and again. And you do that all through what is called the path of meditation. The path of meditation has ten grounds, or ten bhumis, stages where you're purifying the obscurations of afflictions, or the afflictive obscurations, related to having negative states of mind and behaviors. You do that through the first seven stages of the grounds, and then the last, uh, eight, nine, and ten, are actually purified all in one fell swoop, and you're purifying the subtle imprints the obscurations to omniscience, or the knowledge obscurations. 
And then once you've finished that process, you have what is called the path of no more learning, which is Buddhahood itself. So those are the five paths very briefly, and I know that went quite quickly, and I'll make sure to put the chart up. But know that that mantra, gate gate, para gate, parasamgate, bodhisoha, refers to the achievement of those five paths and is a directive to enter those five paths. So what I want us to derive from that explanation today is shine is concentration needs to be perfected and stabilized. Otherwise, whatever realizations we have or understandings we come to won't be able to stick and become stable and consistent. Focus will give every positive action and motivation power. We need focus. So we're going to review the Shine section that you did last semester. For more on this topic, see the subject Salam, or Grounds and Paths. I'll now switch to the simpler version of this table, which is less precise but more accessible. So once again, the path of accumulation begins with the uncontrived realization of the intention to definitively emerge from samsara, also known as determination to be free, renunciation, and the mind of enlightenment, bodhicitta. The path of preparation begins with the union of calm abiding, which is effortless single-pointed concentration, qualified by physical and mental pliancy, and special insight focused on emptiness conceptually. The path of seeing begins, the first moment of the union of calm abiding and special insight focused perceptually on emptiness. The Mahayana path of meditation begins from the second time you meditate on emptiness with a perceptual realization. On this path, there are ten grounds. Grounds one through seven, the obscurations from afflictions are removed. These were left by the seeds of grasping at true existence. The seventh ground is mere nirvana is achieved. Then eight, nine, and ten are removed simultaneously. And that begins the Mahayana path of no more learning, Buddhahood, full enlightenment. And so the result of the path of no more learning is the four Buddha bodies, the three which were impermanent and the one which was permanent, related to our practice of both method and wisdom. The steps to achieve shamatha, shine, serenity, calm abiding, are called the nine stages of sustained attention or mental abidance. The concentration, samadhi, arisen from meditation and accompanied by the bliss of mental and physical pliancy. In this state, the mind abides effortlessly without fluctuation for as long as we wish on whatever object it has been placed. The nine stages of sustained attention and six powers are explained in the Sangha's Shravaka grounds and compendium of knowledge as well as Maitreya's ornament of Mahayana sutras. The nine stages of sustained attention are stages of concentration on the way to quote serenity, a concentration arisen from meditation and accompanied by the bliss of mental and physical pliancy in which the mind abides effortlessly without fluctuation for as long as we wish on whatever object it has been placed. So that's the definition we need to understand. When we talk about serenity, 
or its synonyms, calm abiding, shamatha, shine, single pointed mindfulness meditation, we're looking at this definition where you're able to hold your attention on one thing for as long as you wish and it's effortless. And not only effortless, there is this blissful experience of what is called pliancy, both mental and physical pliancy, meaning flexibility, ease, workability, proficiency, any of those kind of words. So you're able to watch whatever meditation object, and it's very, very pleasant, very, very blissful to do so, and requires no effort. In order to achieve this, you go through stages. It's not like you just magically are able to do this because you have a lot of merit or because you're very smart. It's nothing to do with that. Of course, you do need merit, and it helps to be smart enough to understand basic concepts. But what we're really looking at is practice and repetition. It's developing as if a muscle in exercise. We come back to focusing single-pointedly again and again, and through that repeated effort, we build more and more strength of concentration. Once you're able to achieve this serenity or calm abiding, you're able to go on to unite it with special insight or the wisdom realizing emptiness of inherent existence, in particular, the emptiness of the self. With these two combined perceptually, you can actually cut the root of samsara. So you need some preliminaries in place in order to develop this kind of very strong concentration. And the, the traditional list is here, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then in the brackets over on the side um, are kind of easier ways to understand what's being described. So we should be in a well-contained place if we want to develop concentration, meaning we need to feel safe. We should have little desire, meaning our mind is stable, not chasing different things. Related to that is we should be satisfied with sense objects in the sense of being content. So it's not like you're complacent. It's not like you don't need to gather supplies or resources. It's that what you have, you make peace with quite easily. You settle into your situation without this constant chasing and ambition and needing more and more. Related to that, then, is we should avoid distracting work. We need to already have a level of focus in our life if we want to grow and develop our focus. We should be morally pure, and that kind of has religious connotations, And but what's really meant is ethics. Why is ethics related to concentration? Just sit with that for a moment. What is the relationship between morality or ethics or non-harmfulness, restraint, and being able to focus and have deep concentration? Look at it from the other direction. If you're not ethical, if you're being very immoral, how much does your mind need to dance around and jump around in order to justify or disassociate or excuse or you know, cultivate plans to hide oneself. A mind that's not ethical is very agitated. So the opposite is true. A mind that is ethical sleeps well at night, settles quickly, and can develop focus. And then number six, we should avoid the superstitions that make us attached to sense objects. So calm. And these superstitions, we could call them misconceptions, we could call them wrong understandings, but it's basically these lies we tell ourselves about what we need in order to be happy. And we think we need sense objects to be happy, when in fact they're just conditions. So avoiding these superstitions means separating yourself from your old habits that are constantly seeking more, and really deepening that sense of daily calm. So safe, stable, content, focused, ethical, calm. These are the preliminaries that we need in order to develop the perfection of concentration, samtam. And the perfection of concentration is related to, of course, shine, calm abiding, which we're looking at now. 
So this image is the image that describes the nine stages in terms of the progress. And it should be very useful for us because it shows that you don't have to be good at this from the very beginning. And so let's just go through the picture and then we'll flesh it out. At the beginning is the monastery and you just see a little half of it. It's a picture of like a Tibetan style temple. And this represents renunciation, the determination to be free from samsara. This liberation is achieved through the union of calm abiding and special insight focused on the emptiness of inherent existence, repeated until all afflictive obscurations cease and we've achieved nirvana. So renunciation is vital in order to go on to these higher qualities and actually get out of samsara. In order to actually start learning about calm abiding and to actually pursue it in a daily consistent way, you don't necessarily need perfect renunciation. You don't need to have this perfect determination to be free from samsara. But we need to start to try. We need to start to try to renounce our belief in the outside world as being the only source of our happiness. We need to start taking power back from the external and realizing that deep happiness, contentment, etc., has always come from within, and it's external things that are conditions, not the substantial cause. So we develop renunciation enough that we want to set out on this path of higher concentration in order to go on to cease cyclic existence. And so then we have the monk, and the monk is us. The monk at different locations on the path indicates development of the nine stages to calm abiding serenity. So it's not nine different people, it's the same monk all the way along. And he is carrying a hook, which is related to the power of introspective awareness, and a lasso, or rope, which is the power of mindfulness. So we need these two tools with us when we're developing concentration in order to tame the mind and bring the mind under our own control. So then at the side of the path, throughout most of the path, you see fire. The flame is found from this point until the seventh stage after which it is no longer present, because it's no longer needed. So this is related to the power of effort and the power of complete familiarity in the list of the six powers that we use in order to develop perfect concentration. So the fire decreases in size, indicating the decreasing amount of effort needed to apply mindfulness and introspective awareness. So in the beginning of the path is the hardest, where we are now is where the most effort is needed. It actually will get easier and easier as we progress along the path. Okay, so here's the quick summary. Monastery, renunciation, determination to be free. Leaving the monastery or starting the path, we start to have proficiency with the power of hearing. The monk, as I said before, the nine stages, the practitioner's progress through shine, hook, the power of introspective awareness, lasso, the power of mindfulness, bends in the path, the six powers, the first bend being the power of familiarity, and then kind of towards the center of the path, um, uh, in the middle of each of the straight sections of the path, you see a little hovering thing, like uh, here is a hovering cloth, here is a hovering kind of conch or shell filled with perfume, here, um, here is some fruit, here are symbols, and here is a mirror. And these are the five sensory distractions that pull us off track when we're trying to develop concentration. So the cloth is tactile objects, the perfume is scent is smell, the fruit is taste sensations, symbols are sound, and the mirror represents form. 
So looking at the elephant, the crazed elephant represents the coarse laxity in our mind. So we're just like fighting sleep and fighting laziness and just battling with the mind in the very beginning. And that's why the, the elephant is like running away from us and not in our control whatsoever. We're just chasing it. Then we have the monkey, and the monkey represents restlessness and distraction. So the kind of bouncy, bouncy, bouncy mind that is chasing things here and there. And so at first we're just dealing with coarse laxity and then restlessness and distraction. But then once we get up to this stage here, there's a tiny rabbit or hare that appears on top of the elephant's bum. This rabbit represents subtle laxity. So the subtle laxity appears once you actually start to get the mind quite under control. You know, you're halfway up the path by this point. Here's where you have to start looking at something that feels like concentration. You haven't completely lost your object of meditation, but there's this kind of haze and lack of sharpness and lack of steadiness that happens, which is subtler than what we have right now, which is basically just battling sleep and battling just obvious dullness. So as time goes by and as progress progresses, the color gradient change of the animals is present. So this shows our process of gaining control over obstacles. The animals going from black gradually to white. And as I mentioned before, fire represents the power of effort, strengthened by the power of familiarity. Up at the top the is after shine, or calm abiding, is achieved, the form and formless realm meditative absorptions, which we haven't talked about very much, but it's good to know that they exist. So here's those six powers just as a list, and they're represented by the bends in the path. So we have here at the entrance, or the very beginning of the path, the power of hearing, and then the power of reflection, mindfulness, introspective awareness, effort, and complete familiarity. Now effort is also described with the fire. And then the monk at each of the nine stages represents the nine stages of mental abiding, which are placing or setting the mind, continuous placement, replacement, close placement, taming, pacification, thorough pacification, single-pointedness, and setting in equipoise, after which we get actual calm abiding. So we'll flesh those out. Placing this is the state in which the mind first becomes unaffected by outer objects and fixes in the meditative object. So it's not like it's unaffected by outer objects completely all the time. It's that you're starting to actively disengage. You're able to actively disengage from outer sensory experiences and focus at least a little bit. Continuous placement is the establishment of the stream of mind, meaning that the mind is fixed upon the object for some time by compelling the mind to consider again and again the object of concentration. Replacement, the state when the mind being disturbed, one brings back the mind to the concentration object. So you've steadied yourself, you've placed yourself, and now you've been sitting long enough that you'll start to kind of fall away from the meditation object, but you have enough clarity of mind at this point to bring it back again and again and to not indulge and follow those distractions. And then we have close placement, the state in which the mind is expanded while exactly limited to the object. So the mind is steady on that object, it's close to that object, but the mind is a little bit more spacious and uh, less needing for tightness when it's holding onto the object. And then taming, or mind taming, 
which is done by seeing the ill results of distracting thoughts and defilements, also perceiving the advantages of collectedness, so that one makes efforts to put away the former while establishing the mind in the latter. So you're able to really subdue the mind by considering the faults of not having concentration, all of the negative effects from your life, basically that all of the mistakes in your life especially once you've met a spiritual path and are generally a kind person, all of your mistakes pretty much come from distractions. We're not actively trying to do harm, and yet we still do do harm, because our mind isn't fully under our control and we get distracted and afflictions arise. And then we have number six, pacification or mind calming in which feelings antagonistic to the practice of collectedness are quelled. So collectedness referring to that focused mind, quelled meaning they're dispelled or they're not there anymore, they're pacified. If boredom arises regarding collectedness or focus, since the mind is still hungry for sense objects, then it is thoroughly pacified at this stage. So you see that it's passing by, the monk is passing by that little mirror, meaning that there's no more distraction to the sense objects, right, which existed prior to this point. So it's moved past that. And then thorough pacification is even the subtle stains of mind are set aside here. Single-pointedness. The mind here becomes like one undisturbed stream and continues to flow along one pointedly. And then setting an equipoise. When this state is reached, there is no need for effort since the mind is naturally one pointed. So this is very, very close to calm abiding because there's no effort for the mind to remain single pointedly, but it's not yet qualified by this bliss of physical and mental pliancy. Once that effortlessness is conjoined with bliss, then we have actual calm abiding, shine. So here it is all together. So we have those prerequisites, settled, safe, content, etc., etc. We see the path before us and we really want to start with it. And here we go at the very beginning, the monastery. Representing renunciation is developing in the heart of the meditator. The meditator sets out on the path through the power of hearing. And in the beginning, coarse laxity, the elephant. And coarse restlessness, the monkey, are what we're battling. And right now we have very little control, we're just chasing them. And there's the fire of effort and some sensory distractions. I'm holding the rope of mindfulness and the hook of introspection and getting closer and closer to the elephant and monkey who are beginning to have white heads, meaning a little bit of control has been introduced. And there's the rabbit. The subtle laxity is also appearing. But the animals are starting to become white and slow and look back. And the monk is now leading them rather than chasing them. But see, now that monkey stops and that coarse excitement has been subdued. The rabbit is gone. And now we're just leading the elephant. But it's pretty much under our control. And the monk enters the cave and is able to abide one pointedly in practice. No more effort is needed. And then the monk is able to actually ride the elephant or ride the mind. And it's a blissful experience with this physical and mental pliancy.
and this mental experience goes on to the form and the formless realm concentrations, which are beyond a desire realm mind. So the nine stages, the six powers, and the four attentions we didn't talk about, but basically it's just tight focus, interrupted focus, uninterrupted focus, and spontaneous focus. The five faults and the eight antidotes, we probably discussed before, but in the beginning, the hardest thing is laziness, up here under the five main faults. Laziness is the hardest, and it has four antidotes just for itself. So to overcome laziness, we have conviction, aspiration, effort, and ease, or pliancy of a certain type. And here we're trying to identify the object of meditation and set our mind on it. So once we've developed those four antidotes, then we're working on overcoming forgetfulness. Forgetting the object of meditation and forgetting the instructions. And we're battling forgetfulness as well as just general distractions, which are very much overcome by the antidote of mindfulness. Mindfulness definition is non-forgetting of a virtuous object. Remembering intentionally what is positive. Then the third of the five faults is coarse laxity and excitement restlessness. And then gradually subtle laxity and subtle laxity and restlessness. And these are all overcome through the antidote of introspection. So you have a stronger catching. You stop wandering, less resistance to staying with the meditation object. Non-application of the antidotes is when you know how to adjust the mind and how to balance it in equipoise, but you don't. So, of course, the antidote to that is to apply the antidotes or application. And then you might become so good at applying antidotes that you apply them even when you don't need to. And this is the fault of over-application of antidotes. The antidote to that is what's called applied equanimity, which is not, of course, the same as the mental factor of equanimity or immeasurable equanimity, which are other times you hear that word described. So it means just resting in balance without applying antidotes unnecessarily. And so then placement in equipoise, gradually pliancy is achieved together with that lack of effort needed. So a little more on those. Maitreya outlined the nine stages of sustained attention in his ornament of Mahayana Sutras. Here's the activity of each stage. So one, having directed the mind to the object of observation. Two, do not allow its continuum to be distracted. Three, having noticed distraction, quickly return the mind to that object. Four, be aware, also withdraw the mind inwardly more and more. Five, then, seeing the good benefits of concentration, Tame the mind in concentration. Six, by seeing the faults of distraction, pacify dislike for concentration. Seven, desire and so forth, as well as discomfort and so forth, likewise should be pacified immediately upon arising. Eight, then those who make effort at restraint of faults need only make a little effort to concentrate the mind. 9. Natural arising is attained. Aside from familiarizing with that, one desists from activity. And so summarizing everything one more time briefly. The image reminds us of the different things we need to do in order to develop along the path to achieving perfect concentration, as well as showing us the pitfalls and things to avoid. This should be reassuring for us, as this image is centuries old, and the problems that human beings experience in developing these practices are universal. At the beginning of this process, our mind is unruly and untamed, depicted by the crazed elephant and the distractible monkey. But as we progress, we bring our mind more and more under control, 
until eventually we achieve what is called actual calm abiding or serenity. From this achievement, we can then bring our analysis into the stability of our single-pointed concentration and bring them into union so that we have the union of calm abiding and special insight together, which makes both of them more powerful. The best object, of course, is the union of calm abiding and special insight focused upon the emptiness of inherent existence. From that place, cutting the root of samsara is inevitable. Before we go on to the path to achieve calm abiding, we need certain prerequisites, as described in the fifth paramita, the perfection of concentration. We should be in a well-contained place, have little desire, be satisfied with sense objects, and avoid distracting work. We should be morally pure and avoid the superstitions that make us attached to sense objects. Safe, stable, content, focused, ethical, calm. From there we develop renunciation, shown by the monastery. Then the first power, at the first bend of the path, the power of hearing instructions. The monkey and elephant represent our mind totally out of control. Coarse laxity is the elephant, restlessness and distraction is the monkey. The first fire is the biggest fire, showing the most effort is needed at the beginning. The monk is ourselves at this first stage of mental abidance, where we place the mind on its meditation object. Then we have continuous placement, where the mind is able to abide in the object a little bit longer. We approach the second bend, the power of reflection. We hold the rope of mindfulness and the hook of introspection. At this point, subtle laxity appears, represented by the hair atop the elephant. The changing colors of the animals, as well as their looking backwards, indicates that we're bringing our mind more and more under control. We are also no longer chasing but have actually restrained the mind. At the third bend, we achieve the power of mindfulness and use the power of mindfulness and are at the stage of repeated placement and close placement, able to recognize when the object is lost and reset attention on it, as well as strengthen mindfulness so it can remain longer and longer without distraction. The monkey of distraction and restlessness has been completely subdued. Then we have the stage of taming and then pacifying, which are driven by the power of introspective awareness. We stop wandering and so can remain on the object almost continuously. Then we abandon all resistance to concentration, identify laxity and restlessness before they arise. Then the stage of thoroughly pacifying and making single-pointed, driven through the power of effort, where only a little effort is needed at the beginning of the session. Then placement in equipoise, through the power of complete familiarity, we achieve pliancy, and no effort is needed to maintain mindfulness and introspective awareness. The mind habitually remains single-pointed. Then we have calm abiding serenity. Both physical and mental pliancy and bliss have been achieved. The monk rides the completely pacified elephant by attaining the union of serenity and insight with emptiness as the object. The monk holds the sword of wisdom. Ignorance, the root of samsara, is now in the process of being cut. With extremely powerful mindfulness and wisdom represented by the flames, the meditator continues to meditate on emptiness. With his mind informed by bodhicitta, he eradicates all defilements from the mind. So because that was review from last semester, we're not going to go back over it, and unless there's a lot of pressing questions, um, we can talk about those next week if you need to. But a really excellent book is called Following the Footsteps of the Buddha by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Venerable Thubten Chodron. It's an amazing follow-up, and I really recommend it. See you next time.